like to welcome everyone here this morning. Uh, and as you can tell, Dean's not with us this morning. She'll be back with us next week. Her and Pinky have gone on a little vacation. Uh, we've got a few announcements I'd like to make this morning. If you will, continue to remember Sunday school. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to invite everybody to come out to Sunday school. It starts at 9.45. <coughs> There's appropriate classes for all ages. Also, this coming week, we've got several things coming on. Uh, Wednesday at 12 o'clock, we have the senior luncheon. We have a special program this coming Wednesday at 12 o'clock. There's a gentleman that's going to be coming that's going to be playing the violin. So if you will, come on out and support him and support the senior luncheon. Also, the pastor's table is at 6 p.m. If you'll come out, uh, we'll have free food. It's free. Pastor provides it. Donations will be accepted. Uh, get fed, spiritually and physically. It's a good time of the Lord. Also, at 7 o'clock, we have the adult Bible study and the children, the kids' club. Come on out. Uh, we'd love to have you here. Choir practice is at 8 o'clock. This is very important. Each and every one of you here can come and sing in the choir. Wouldn't that be great to have the choir full and nobody out here? That'd be wonderful. Wouldn't it, Tony? Absolutely. Uh, we are also practicing the Christmas cantata. So if you like Christmas music, now's the time to join the choir. Isn't that right, Tom? All right. Very important, next week, Friends Day, we're having a fall Friends Day. What this is, is this is just a Sunday. It's just a time that we set aside to gather all our friends, family, invite them to church. Statistics tell us that 80% of those that we would invite would come if we asked them. This is 80% of our friends and family. They would come if only we would ask. A lot of times we just don't ask for whatever reason. So we want to take this opportunity to go out and invite those to come and fellowship with us next week. Also, this coming Saturday, we're having a fall a rod at uh, Chuck and David Tipton's house. It starts at 5 p.m. There is a sign-up sheet out front. It's on the lectern in the fellowship hall. If you will, please sign up. Please sign up and bring a dish or um, some type of food. Uh, you will take cash also, right, sir? Yes. <laughs> You'll take cash. Uh, no, that's all joking. All joking aside, we have a great time every year at Chucky Davis' house. Um, anybody and everybody's welcome. Invite your friends, come around. It's a good time for us to get together. Also, this afternoon, after service, we're going to have a brief meeting with the prayer team. We met here yesterday at 9.30 while the pantry was going on, and we had a wonderful worship experience. I don't know how else to put it. If you were not here with the prayer team, you missed a blessing. Um, the Lord moved yesterday, and I think He's moving again this morning. Um, he wants us to do His will and start solving our communication with Him through prayer. Also, the pantry was here yesterday as it is the third Saturday of each month. We had a great day. We had 40 plus families that were fed yesterday through the pantry and clothed. Um, I'd like to thank all the volunteers that came out yesterday. Everyone that donated, maybe were able to come out yesterday. Um, this is a ministry that is ministering to the community. Um, but you know, it's also a ministry to us. The folks that come out to work receive a big blessing as the one that are receiving the food. Are there any other announcements at this time? If not, if everyone will stand, let's welcome one another.
the Lord in prayer. Before we go to the Lord in prayer, we have a couple prayer requests and praises. Uh, one praise I want to make known is made, made known on Wednesday. I want to make known this morning. Jack's been is healed. Right. He's waiting to go to the doctor to be released, and hopefully you'll see his smiling face here next Sunday morning. Amen. Uh, that is the prayer and the plan. Is that correct, Sarah? Amen. It is. Uh, let's remember to keep Jack in our prayers and his family in our prayers. Uh, Jack's been through a lot in the last couple of months, and let's continue to lift him up. Also, another praise report, Debbie has a job. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a praise. <laughs> that is definitely a praise. Uh, and I know that means a lot to Debbie. Uh, it means a lot to Chuck. It also means a lot to us because that is the Lord answering prayer. Amen. He definitely answers our prayers. And we need to bring these praises to Him just like we do our requests. Uh, also, let's continue to remember Mary Ann, who's unable to be with us here this morning. Let's continue to lift her up in prayer. Let's also continue to remember Ms. Daphne Jones. Let's remember her and her family. Uh, any other prayer requests this morning? I have a praise. Praise? Uh, my sister Chris, if all tests go well on Monday, she may be home for Thanksgiving and be able to be treated from a local hospital, which is, she's right now in Minnesota, and if she goes home to Fort Wayne, she'll be able to see her family. That's awesome. Thank you for all the prayers. Let's remember uh, Carmela's aunt and Charles' sister, uh, Chris. Let's continue to lift her up in prayer. Any others? Remember my walking with ribs. She fell last Sunday. She's got to go fight for Let's remember, as he put it, Wesley's woman. Let's remember Ms. Juanita. Uh, she fell last Sunday. A serious note, she did fall and she cracked or bruised some ribs. Uh, let's remember Juanita. Uh, let's also remember Wesley. Uh, any other prayer request? If not, if you have an unspoken request you'd like to make it on by another hand, please do so now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for your mercy and grace. Lord, I thank you for each and every one that's here this morning. Lord, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you've done for me, Father, and my family, and for what you've done for our Lord. Lord, I just pray that you touch each and every need, Father, this one lifts up to you this morning, Father. You know each and every heart. Lord, I pray that your will be done. Lord, I lift this service up to you today, Father. This is a special service. It's a deacon ordination service, Father. Lord, that you touch the deacons in a mighty way. And as you touch Robert, as he's ordained this morning, Father, Lord, I also pray that you continue to touch this ministry and that you draw us closer together and unite us together to go forth and be a light to this community, Father. Lord, I lift up this service from the music to the preaching of your word. That each and everything that's done here today is only done to honor and glorify your holy name and nothing more. Lord, just be with us in your name we pray. Amen. Well, let's worship. Let's stand together and sing hymn number four.
Father, we thank you this morning for this beautiful day. And we ask you to bless each and every one in each of your name. We ask you to bless this offer. We ask this in Jesus' name.
Let's give our hearts completely and solely to Jesus Christ. And some of us have made a profession of faith, but we haven't continued to walk down that path. We haven't kept our eyes focused on Christ. We've been distracted by the way of the world. Haven't we? Amen. It's easy to happen. It's easy to lose focus. But this morning, all the challenges. Let's refocus. Let's seek Jesus in all things. This morning is an extraordinary morning for Parkwood Baptist Church. Today, we'll be ordaining the deacon. We'll be ordaining Brother Robert and as a deacon of the to the church. This is an office that should not be taken lightly. And today's message is going to center around, center around what it means to be a deacon. Not only for the deacon, but for the church. Do you realize not only does the deacon have responsibilities, but the church has responsibilities? We as a church have responsibilities to support our deacons, to support the leaders in the ministries, also to minister ourselves. Because sometimes we think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's okay. But don't sometimes we think as a church that the deacons or the pastor and the Sunday school teachers, they're supposed to take care of certain things and we're not have to worry about it? We do, don't we? And there's a little truth to that. However, all of us that is called to believe in Jesus Christ is called to go out and minister Amen. to the community, to our friends, to our family. And I only encourage you to invite your friends and family to church next week. That is a way to minister to the community. A simple invitation to those around you. Today we're going to look at Scripture to see how the office of deacon came about. And the importance of having righteous deacons. What does that mean? Not self-righteous, but righteous. Right in the sight of God. Deacons that live their lives accordingly to the book, to the Word of God. This morning, if you will, go ahead and turn to Acts, Acts chapter 6. This is the first passage that we'll be looking at. You see, the office of deacon is truly a called office. You must have a calling to serve as a deacon. It's not something that we just choose to do. There truly must be a calling if you are a true deacon. Too many times we get in our mind that a deacon is a position of power. A deacon is an office that helps run the church or runs the church. That is not the case. And we're going to look at scripture what a deacon really is. We have deacons that understand that. We've had deacons that are not serving currently but are still deacons that understand that. The office of deacon is simply an office of service to the church. Amen. They're to serve the church at all costs, to put the church's needs first in front of their own. You see, there are certain qualifications that you must meet in order to obtain the office of deacon. We're going to look at those this morning. You must also have that true calling to serve your brothers and sisters. And most importantly, to serve Jesus in all areas of your life. Because you need to understand, and Brother Robert, you need to understand, our deacons, Trey and Chuck, they need to understand. Future deacons that will be called to serve this church, they need to understand. Church, you need to understand. That once you're called to an office of deacon, you're called to a higher calling. You are held at higher standards according to Scripture because you are teaching others. Deacons typically are Sunday school teachers. They're leaders in the church. They provide guidance to church members. They visit the sick. They help the afflicted. <coughs> People look up to you in the office of deacon, also in the office of pastor, Sunday school teacher. We are held at a higher standard according to Scripture because if we teach someone wrong, we're held accountable 
or when they fall. Does that make sense? Amen. We need to remember that. And we need to keep that in the forefront. Families, wives, children of deacons, remember to give your husband, your wife, whoever the deacon is, the support that they need because it's a tough job, isn't it? I can speak as pastor and other deacons that are here can speak. It's a tough job because you have to be willing and able to listen and help others in need. Sometimes you have to put your plans off in order to help someone else. Sometimes you have to sacrifice your time in order to serve Jesus Christ by helping someone else. Sometimes you may have to get up a half an hour early in order to go pick someone up and bring them to church because they don't have a ride. That's one example. You may have to go take someone to the grocery store because they need food and they can't go themselves. You may have to just get up and pray because let the Lord has laid something on your heart. You see, as a true Christian or believer, we're to put Jesus Christ first in all things. If you will, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 6. We're going to start with verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples were increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Notice what's happening. I'm going to stop here for a second. One sect in the church was complaining about the other sect. There was a little backbiting. There was a little frustration because they felt they weren't being treated properly. Does that happen in the church today? It does, doesn't it? We're going to see what the disciples did at the urging of the Spirit in order to keep that from interrupting with them studying the Word of God. Because what happens when there's backbiting in the church? What happens when there's frustration in the church? What happens when somebody gets upset with somebody else? I'll tell you what happens. The first thing they do is run to the pastor. Isn't that the truth? You know what that was the truth? Is that where you're shaking your hands? Laughing? It's the truth. Why is that? Because they don't want the pastor to hear what happened from the other person. Not only do they run to the pastor, they run to the deacon. They run to their brother and sister. Should we do that as a church? See, that's our problem to begin with, is with people. We're flesh and blood. First thing we should do according to Scripture is turn it over to the Lord. Then we're to go to our brother and sister that we have a problem with and discuss it among ourselves. Not bring other people in, but handle the situation there. And that's another sermon for another time. However, if we did that, there would be a less of a need of deacons, wouldn't there? Less of a need of teachers. It's a good start. Let's look at verse 2. So the twelve, the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, Choose seven men from among you who were known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Understand that the disciples at the time were the preachers. They were the pastors. They were the ones that were leading the congregations. They were the ones that were leading the church. The argument that ensued well, they were fussing about being served food. Basically, they believed that some people were being overlooked. Or they may not have been being served first. I want to share a little story with you. When I was growing up, there were certain things we knew. We were going to eat at church at least once a month. I was a Baptist. We ate. We do that here. We were going to eat all the time. And I can also promise you that when we ate, 
My dad was going to be the first person in line, no matter what. It was the truth. That has changed a little bit over time. He's no longer the first person in line, but his life has changed. He's changed. He would get mad if somebody got in front of him. Didn't matter if it was a visitor. Didn't matter if it was a church member. He would get mad. So I tell you this story to understand, to let you know that I understand what was going on here. You may smile, smirk, because you may have a similar story. When I was growing up, food was scarce at my house. When I was at my grandparents, we had plenty. But at my house, mom and dad, we didn't have a lot of food. And you fought for what you got. And you protected what you got. So I understand fussing and fighting over food. Mom, I'm going to be shaking your head. Do you understand what I'm saying? But as we get older, it seems a little silly, doesn't it? Some of the conflicts we have in church are a little silly, aren't they? So the disciples, at the discretion of the Holy Spirit, put in place the deacon ministry. The deacons are set up to serve tables. They're set up to wait on the church. They're set up to be a service for Jesus Christ. That is our sole purpose as a deacon. I was a deacon before I became a pastor. The sole purpose is to serve the church in all manners, not just food, but in any way possible. Too often we like to think of it as a position of power, when in true honesty, there is no power that goes along with the office of deacon. Let's look at verse 5. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Hercules, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenesus, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. You see, that's what we do with the deacons. They are chosen by the church. They're presented to the church. The deacons and myself in a few minutes will pray over Robert. We will lay hands on Robert and pray over him and his ministry and this church's ministry. And then the church will welcome Robert in as a deacon. Let's look at verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Notice what happened when they put these men to work. The apostles were given more time to study the Word of God and to preach the Word of God. When deacons come into the church, it gives the pastor more time to preach and to study. It also gives him a person to go out with on visitation. It also gives him a person to reach out to others with. It also gives him other areas of resources. You see, this is the first account of deacons chosen in the New Testament church. Again, I want you to notice the purpose was to serve the church body. This is truly a ministry decision. Your duties are included, but are not limited to visiting the sick, helping serve the church ordinances, teaching and serving one another, there are certain qualifications that go along with being a deacon. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. If you will, go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, 
hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not forceful, and not a lover of money. Stop there for a second. I'm speaking of the overseer. I'm speaking of the pastor. I'm not speaking of the deacon at this point. We will in a second. But the reason that I'm reading this is because when we get down a few more verses, we're going to discover that it points back to some of the same duties as the overseer. Let me reread verse 2 for you. Now the overseers will be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. Not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not forceful, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. You understand, whether you're a pastor, deacon, church member, Sunday school teacher, whatever the case may be, a believer of the body of Christ, the devil's got a trap for you. Amen. He does. He's got a trap for you. He's going to ensnare you wherever he can. It is our duty as believers to study the Word. It is our duty to dig deeper into the Word of God so that we will not fall into temptation. In the same way, in verse 8, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malice talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ. Not only do deacons and pastors have a calling and qualifications that they must meet, they must continue to meet them as they serve. The church also has commands and teachings that it must honor and obey. It is also the church's responsibility to lift up the deacons, the pastor, the Sunday school teachers, each other in prayer and supplication. You understand that's our main call is to lift up one another and to go out and to bring those on the roadside, in the road, in the homes, everywhere into this church. Amen. Not into Parkland Baptist Church, but into the kingdom of God. Amen. We're to bring them in. We're to give them the word. I was taught a long time ago, and this service is a little different than most because it is a deacon ordination service. I was taught a long time ago to preach Jesus and everything else will fall into place. I'm going to share something with you this morning that was shared with me the same time I learned that. Live Jesus and everything else will fall into place. Don't just live him on Sunday and Wednesday. Live him Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday and see how your life will change. You see, it is our responsibility as a church to lift up one another. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. And yes, I know we're doing a lot of turning. We're doing a lot of looking today. A lot more than we normally do. But it's for God's will. Because we need to understand how to live as a church and how to treat each other and how to lift up our deacons, our leaders in the church. Verse 1, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit 
through the bond of peace. There is only one body and one spirit, just as you were called the one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and the Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives, and gave gifts to his people. Before we go any further, do you understand that we all have talents? We all have gifts. And if we don't use those gifts and talents, we'll lose them. Amen. I've been encouraging a few folks recently to step up. We have some needs in the church. Those needs are simple. We need teachers for the children. We're called to train up the child in the ways of the Lord. We need teachers. Do you have to be experienced teachers? No. We'll equip you. We will train you. That's what we're supposed to do as a church. But we need folks that are willing to go back and work with the Lord. And if you don't feel like you're a teacher, we need folks that can sit in the nursery. We've got teachers, but we need assistance. We need folks that can be back there because we need bodies. We need at least two people all the time in the nursery. There are many gifts and talents. You may be called to sing in the choir. I made a comment earlier about everybody can sing in the choir. Well, Pastor, you don't want to hear me sing. Nobody else does either. If you don't believe me, you can ask Robert. You don't want to hear me sing. I say that jokingly because one day I was leading the music. He had the earphones on and I started singing and he had me muted. Y'all couldn't hear me, but he could hear me. Those earphones came off pretty fast. I'm telling the truth, aren't I, Robert? Now, with that said, the Lord wants us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Amen. That simple. A joyful noise unto the Lord. Well, what does it have to do with being a deacon? It has everything to do with it. Because before you can be a deacon, you have to be a believer. You have to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You have to be willing to step out of your comfort zone and follow His will. Let's look at verse 9. What does He ascended mean except that He has descended lower to the earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all heavens in order to fill the whole universe. The He here He's referring to is Jesus Christ. Do you understand? He overcame death when He was raised from the dead. I think my battery just died, Robert, so it's okay. He overcame death when he was raised from the dead. He descended to the grave and he ascended into heaven. Without that, we have no faith. Without Jesus Christ dying on that cross, being buried, risen again, we have no faith. If you will, let's look at verse 11. Bear with me one second here. Verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for the works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. In verse 14, Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. Understand that Christ is the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Not the pastor, not the deacons, not any committee, any board. The head of this church is Christ. And it should be. 
Verse 16, from him the whole body joins and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Do you understand we're the body of Christ? Amen. You and I. Together we work as one. Or we should work as one. Amen. Some of us are the hand. Some of us are the feet. Some of us are the tongue. We need to remember that Christ is the head and that we should serve Him at all times. You see, the Scripture has given us a path to take in this ordination of the deacon. It has also shown us how this position should be fulfilled and what duties the deacon and church has to uplift and serve for the cause of Christ. At this time, I'm going to ask Robert and his family to come forward. Robert, will you put me on the fire this morning? Thank you, Robert, too. Faith 
in Christ Jesus. Listen, Robert, to the monstration given to you and to your fellow believers. Robert, do you promise to strive to so live that you may honor Christ by your life? And do you promise, in the presence of this congregation, to accept the responsibility of the office of deacon in this church and to the best of your knowledge and ability to discharge all duties of this office? I do. Robert, if you will, please have a seat over here next to Carmelo. This is the charge to the church. It's not just to Robert. Do you, members of this congregation, acknowledge Robert as a deacon in the church? Do you promise to encourage and pray for him and his office and to cooperate him in the fulfillment of the mission of the church? If you do so, please say, I do. At this time, I'll ask for Robert and his family, if you will, please come up and stand. <coughs> Craig and Chuck, would you come forward, please? Robert, I'm going to ask you to stand right here. Chuck, will you stand on this side of it? Craig, will you come and stand on the other side? Carmel, will you stand right here? Christian, stand right here. And I'm going to ask... I'm going to ask that everyone, um, if the deacons and his family will lay hands on Robert at this time. Be gracious, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, I lift up Robert to you. Lord, I lift up his family to you. Lord, I lift up Parkwood Baptist Church to you. And Lord, I just pray that we support each other in the way that is calling and fulfilling of your service, Father. Lord, I just pray that your will be done in Robert's life and in the life of Parker Baptist Church. Lord, I just pray that he has the heart of the Lord, Father. And Lord, that each of us have the heart of Jesus Christ and that we're willing to lift up one another, love one another, accept one another, and move forward for the gospel of Christ. Lord, just be with us, guide us, and direct us. In your name I pray. And at this time, at this time, I'm going to ask Robert and his family to stand here. We're going to close in prayer. They're going to stand up front, and we're going to ask for the church to come by and to welcome him in as a deacon. Uh, let, us, let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for your mercy and your grace. I thank you for each and everything that you've done for us. Lord, I just pray that your will be done in this church, in our lives. Lord, that we'll humble ourselves before you and be willing to serve you in any manner that's befitting you, Father. Lord, just be with us, guide us, and direct us. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.
Oh yeah, I've done that long list to you. Thank <laughs> you. 